We're here at the Genogli Gallery in Nottingham for the opening of a new survey exhibition of the work of Elizabeth Frink. You've been working with the Elizabeth Frink Archive for 20 years now, so what made you decide to put this show on right now? About two years ago, we were asked whether it was possible to arrange a Frink exhibition for Nottingham and the Genogli Gallery. I accepted and, uh, and then I had to think of a story. And I've always been interested in how her sculptures sort of live out in the outside world, not just in galleries, and because she had lots of commissions, and it's a completely untold story. So um, I thought that's what we would look at. We would look at the, we'd build an exhibition around her commission work. And how different is it for a sculptor when they're creating works that are going to be shown outdoors or in the public sphere? Oh, that's a very good point. <laughs> um, incredibly different, diff different, because when you're, if you're creating work for yourself inside your studio, then you're sort of engaged with your own ideas. And then you'll, if you're lucky, you'll have a gallery somewhere who's willing to put on exhibitions and to sell those works. And you might have, you might have built up as Liz did, um, a, num a number of patrons who love, love her work. But when commissioners come to you, they have got their own ideas about what they want. And what was fascinating about Frink was that she came into, she emerged as a sort of professional artist that was sort of taken up quite early on in her career. And it was just after the Second World War. So Britain was faced with this huge task of rebuilding bomb cities their utopian visions of creating better places for people to live, creating new towns, new urban environments. And they were coming to this sort of young sculptor in those, in those days, uh, as, as, she, as she was, and commissioning her to make work for that. So that was a very exciting story. And uh, so I wanted to put those sort of two elements together. And also then to see how the sculptures had fared over the years. So some of them been, have been in there, you know, since the sort of early 50s. Uh, and and there's most, pretty well all of them are still there. There's only one that's, um, that didn't survive. And, uh, and so of course, then the sculptures themselves become part of the place. They become perhaps taken up by the community as part of their own sense of place. They take on the history of the place. Uh, they sort of act as these sort of almost quiet observers of what's changed in our community. And certainly in terms of life in Britain, life has changed enormously. But the sculptures that you've got here in the gallery, you've not taken them away from there? We've outside. not taken any away at all. But, but what happens is that sometimes uh, a piece with a similar piece will be cast in addition. So sometimes it's unique and sometimes it's cast in, in addition. So where it's in addition, we have tried to get hold of that sculpture. The other thing is the way that Liz worked. So Liz, Liz worked very much, uh, well, she worked independently. She had no assistance to help her whatsoever. And, and so that means that when she was thinking through an idea, she would do lots of drawings. She would uh, make work at different scales. Uh, uh, and over the years, she would be continually exploring certain themes. So she has sort of arrived very early on at, at these forms that interested her because what she was concerned with was really humanity, how, how having grown up during the war, sort of, you know, the sort of nature of the human species and what we will do, particularly in terms of our vulnerability our capacity for aggression. And uh, so very deep sort of complex, complex um, sort of things which fed her throughout her working life. So, so for example, with one of her earliest commissions as Blind Beggar and Dog. So right at the beginning, you've got this relationship between man and another animal species. And not only the relationship, but actually sort of looking at how perhaps the animal species functions and how the human species functions. Uh, and that became very important, particularly when she moved to France. And then at some point later, she starts to reintroduce sort of the image of a dog, or the form of a dog, to express her feelings about humanity. Not so much about the sort of a dog, 
but more in terms of expressing feelings. So the animals are being used metaphorically? Yes, all the work is metaphorical. Mm -hmm. mm. What about the horses? The horses as well. In fact, the horses probably more than, even more, more so, because there's this sort of strong relationship between uh, animals that we have brought into our world that are, are no longer wild. Although she looked at some, she looked at wild birds particularly. The other thing that she's quite interested in is shape-shifting. So to begin with in her work, she's shifting one shape into another within the same form. So a man becomes a beast, a beast becomes a bird. Late, later on, she becomes more subtle than that. And actually, she has this sort of shape shifting going in within the same form. So she has the outer shell of the, the human image or the animal image, and then what might be contained inside. So there's that sort of shift from external to internal. Can you say a little bit more about the actual working process? You said she works without assistance. Yes. So she, quite very early on, she decided that well, when she was a student, she liked working with plaster. Because she's not working with assistants, so she's not giving them a, a maquette, you, you've got this energy that comes while you're thinking through an idea. So with plaster, you, you, can, you build up an armature like a skeleton, and then you can put the plaster on very quickly. So she could put wet plaster on. She, could, she would add little bits of, uh, of, of material, of paper, of scrim, of wood, Sometimes she re even reused bits of dried up plaster to sort of get the, for get the form. And then she would start to work it back. So she would use uh, wasps, which are sort of scraping tools, chisels, which are cutting tools, until she'd got the sort of surface that she wanted as well. So you see in her early works, lots of wet, drippy plaster. And you see that plaster with all sorts of wonderful sort of uh, caverns and rough sort of surfaces which sort of catch, catch the light a lot. When she moves to France, because the light is so much more intense, she starts to pare that down. So she moves away onto rather more smoother surfaces. She's also got more space because she's in a bigger studio down in France. And so the surfaces become not quite so exaggerated and they become slightly drier, and then you get very subtle lines and marks. So she explores that. When she came back to England, she brings all of that thinking and experience into her work. And then slowly, when she's in um, Dorset, she takes, in some sculptures, she takes it to the next stage and she becomes a carver. So she allows the, the plaster to become completely dry and then she takes a chisel and she just works over the whole surface and she works it over with these wonderful rhythmic marks. And you see that in the drawings as well. Her drawings follow the same evolution as the techniques she's using for the sort of plaster. And so when you look at the early drawings, they're sort of ink and wet and drippy. And then when they're in France, they're very linear and sort of lots of space and sort of single, single lines sort of holding a shape. Um, and then she, she doesn't necessarily abandon any of those techniques, she just grows with those sort of techniques. And then later on when she's carving, you see these, these drawings which are full of wonderful marks and colour, because she starts to introduce colour. So once she's made the plaster, then that gets cast into a more uh, into a material that's going to survive. In the early days, it would be cast in concrete because there wasn't much money, but quite early on, she's able to cast in bronze. So the plaster goes off to the foundry. The foundry make molds, and then they cast the piece in bronze. And when it comes out at that stage, it's quite a shiny surface. And so then it has to be patinated, which is sort of oxidizing the surface to give a di different colors. So you get different colors. And so Liz would work at that point in the foundry and working out what sort of patination that she wanted on the piece. And um, after a trip to Australia, she just came back in, infused with, sort of infused with the sort of idea of using colour. And so then we start to see coloured patinations, real coloured reds, sort of like the Easter head over there, sort of lots, uh, lots of 
lots of colour, masks coming onto the um, sculptures. And, uh, and, and you see that in the drawings as well. This sculpture of St John Bosco was recently rediscovered after being lost for 50 years. How did you find it? It was a chance discovery. Um, it's had a kind of a very chequered history. It was originally made for Roman Catholic Church of, of um, St Bosco, Woodley, at, at, uh, near Reading. Um, and it was thought that at some point in the early 1960s that this piece had been destroyed or partially destroyed. There's a story that um, you know, a, a, a lorry might have backed into it. Um, but, but what we do know is that it really disappeared off the scene for, um, for 45 years. Um, last year, the um, catalogue resume of, of um, Frink's work was, was um, published. And the um, present owner of this work, who I think had suspected that he might have a Frink, but wasn't, wasn't absolutely sure, um, and he made contact with the Beaux-Arts Gallery in London, which is the commercial gallery which um, now represents um, Frink's work. And, of course, they were able to, um, to contact um, Annette Ratushniak at the, uh, the Frink estate and to verify that this, in fact, is the piece that's been missing all that time. So, of course, it's a, an incredibly exciting um, discovery, both for the estate and, and for this particular exhibition, um, because what we're looking at is the first public commission that, that Frink received uh, in 1952. Um, she was still a student at um, uh, Chelsea, um, so, you know, very, very young. Um, and, um, and in fact, um, what we have is not quite the, the, the full sculpture. Um, this is the, 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 the figure of um, St John Bosco, um, a, a relatively recent um, saint from the 19th century. And originally he stood with two children, um, a little girl and a little boy. And, um, well, we don't know if the, the little boy was a casualty of that, um, that truck backing into him, but um, he's, he's not here now. Um, we had this piece um, um, partially restored, um, conserved, um, just really because it, it, um, it, it has been living its sort of recent life in, in a garden, so we wanted to get rid of the, you know, the worst sort of debris that a piece of garden statuary would, would acquire. Um, and as you can see, it's got some of the original um, paintwork um, that uh, may or may not have actually been applied by, by Frink uh, herself. And a rather nice little um, detail to point out to people is that although we don't have the little boy anymore, we do have his footprints which have appeared in that, um, uh, uh, in that conservation process. Um, so we're standing here in a recreation of um, Elizabeth's studio. Can you tell us how this came about? I mean, what were you working from? When Elizabeth Frink died, a photographer went in and recorded Woolland. So Woolland was her final studio. She had various studios in London, France, back in London and then finally in Dorset and the, Dors the Dorset in particular is incredibly well recorded through hundreds and hundreds of photographs and also uh, we have so much of the material that came out of all her working tools uh, um, and, and lots of the material in including chairs that you know were used that she sat on, the chair that, that um, Alec Guinness sat on when he had his sort of portrait done, the sort of stands, the skull that she'd been moving, a horse skull that she'd been moving around for years. So we just thought we'd like people to have a chance of coming into her world. Because again, coming back to the commissions, when she's making these work, she's inside her studio, you know, it, and she's creating this piece for the outside, but it's all happening inside her studio. So it's her very private place. And, uh, and we're so fortunate in the archive to have so much of Liz's private world and we wanted to share that with people. So we thought that we would, because we have such a good photographic record of Woolland in particular, that we would sort of evoke the sense of coming into the studio at Woolland. And so uh, all the photographs are from there, all the objects. Also because um, it was a very good way of sort of showing all the plasters, or not all of them, it's just a fraction of the plasters, but actually so that you can see the plasters and then realise that's what she was working with and that was then cast in, in bronze. And uh, 
we also have her music playing, the music that she listened to every, you know. So, because we know every morning as she went in, she turned on the radio first thing. And we have a very good record of the music she listened to and the music she loved. So people can come into this studio and listen to the music that Liz was listening to. Mm.